I'm Suzanne Maloney, Vice President and Director of Foreign Policy here at the Brookings Institution. Thank you so much for joining us today for this important and timely discussion about the implications of the deterioration of relations between the United States and Russia for arms control and nuclear security. In a speech last week marking the first anniversary of his brutal invasion of Ukraine, Russian Ple President Vladimir Putin announced that Moscow would suspend its participation in the New START Treaty after the demise of landmark agreements such as the Anti-Ballistic Missile and Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaties, New START is the last remaining nuclear arms control agreement between Washington and Moscow. Putin's latest move reduces prospects for a follow-on agreement to replace New START when it expires in February 2026, a prospect that was already substantially diminished as a result of the war in Ukraine. Russia's decision has drawn widespread condemnation, including from President Biden. The precarious state of New START has amplified concerns here in Washington and around the world about the future of arms control, the possibility of a destabilizing nuclear arms competition among the world's major powers, and the risk of armed conflict escalating to the nuclear level. Joining us today to address Russia's New START suspension and prospects for arms control and risk reduction in the current environment is Mallory Stewart who serves as Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Arms Control Verification and Compliance. She will be delivering keynote remarks here from the podium, and following her presentation, there will be a discussion moderated by my colleague, Robert Einhorn, on the implications of Russia's suspension of its participation in the New START Treaty. Let me briefly introduce our distinguished speakers. Assistant Secretary Stewart joined the Bureau of Arms Control Veri Verification and Compliance in 2022 after serving as Special Assistant to President Biden and Senior Director for Arms Control, Disarmament, and Nonproliferation at the National Security Council since January 2021. She previously served as a Senior Manager at the Center for Global Security and Cooperation at Sandia National Laboratories, as Deputy Assistant Secretary in the ABC Bureau at the Department of State, and as an, as an attorney at State's Office of the Legal Advisor. Assistant Secretary Stewart was also the lead lawyer on the negotiations that led to the 2013 U.S.-Russian framework for the elimination of Syrian chemical weapons. Bob Einhorn is a senior fellow in the Strobe Talbot Center for Security, Strategy, and Technology at Brookings Foreign Policy. During the Obama administration, Bob served as Special Advisor for Nonproliferation and Arms Control at the State Department, a position that was specifically created by then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. He also served as Assistant Secretary of State for Nonproliferation during the Bill Clinton administration and has held many other positions both in government and in academia working on nonproliferation issues. Before I hand the mic over to Assistant Secretary Stewart, I would like to note that we are streaming live and on the record today. For those of you who are joining us virtually, you can submit your questions to events at brookings.edu or using the hashtag NewStartSuspension on social media. For those in person, we will have a Q&A period at the end of our uh, event today, and staff will come around with microphones for you to join the conversation. Thank you, and the floor is now yours, Assistant Secretary. Thank you to the Brookings Institution for having me here today. Thank you all for being here. As you know, we have just passed the one year anniversary of Russia's illegal and unconscionable continuing invasion of Ukraine. Last week, we learned that President Putin had chosen to hold the one remaining bilateral nuclear arms control treaty between the United States and Russia hostage to his expansionist goals. As President Biden recently highlighted, Putin's decision is a mistake. Russia's announced suspension of New START will not deter the United States or its allies and partners from supporting Ukraine. In fact, Moscow's decision and its continuing nuclear threats will only reinforce how important standing behind Ukraine remains for the United States and the global community. President Biden has made it clear that no matter what else is happening in the world, the United States is ready to pursue critical arms control measures. The president said this not despite the security threats that exist, but because of them. Arms control isn't something that you cast aside when tensions are on the rise. On the contrary, the value of arms control is greatest when conditions are ripe for miscalculation, escalation, and spiraling arms races. 
That is why Russia's announcement last week that is, it is suspending its participation in New START is so troubling. We are watching carefully to see what Russia actually does in the wake of President Putin's announcement, and we are engaging with Russian officials to get a more detailed explanation of their actions. Most importantly, we will make sure that under these new circumstances, we remain postured to defend the United States and our allies. Given the misinformation that continues to flow from Moscow, it is important to highlight how we arrived at this point. When this administration began, we and the Russian Federation extended New START for the full five years allowed under the agreement because both sides saw that it was clearly in the security interests of our respective countries. And Russian officials have affirmed their support for New START many times because, like us, they understand that neither country is better off in a world where the two largest nuclear powers no longer engage in stabilizing forms of transparency. The, this only underscores what an unfortunate step Putin's announced suspension is. His actions threaten not only the viability of New START, but also the future of U.S.-Russian nuclear arms control. Furthermore, Putin's desire to promote instability and to manipulate nuclear risks is more likely to drive countries to band closer together for their common defense. And it certainly will not compel the United States to back down in its support for Ukraine. In terms of how we got here, let me outline Russians' non-compliance with New START, which began long before Putin announced his intention to suspend the treaty. During the pandemic, the United States and Russia mutually accepted a pause to New START inspections. In June of 2022, that understanding lapsed after it became clear to both parties that we could resume inspections while keeping our inspectors and the inspected parties safe. In August of 2022, Russia refused to comply with its obligation under New START to facilitate inspection activities on its territory. And Russia has maintained that position since then. Contrary to Russian assertions, there is nothing preventing Russian inspectors from traveling to the United States and conducting inspections. Since the summer of 2022, we have made crystal clear to Russia that we are prepared to honor our obligation to host Russian inspectors. Russian state aircraft have viable air routes to transport inspectors to the United States, and Russian inspectors can also use commercial air, air travel to reach United States territory under the treaty. We put significant time and effort into engaging Russia, other countries, and private entities to ensure Russia can fully exercise its inspection rights. Just to make sure there's absolutely no confusion on this point, there are no transit visa requirements, overflight restrictions, or financial or other sanctions that prevent Russia from fully exercising its treaty rights. If Russia has valid concerns about a specific Russian facility subject to inspection activities, there are treaty provisions that can be invoked, but Russia's blanket denial of inspections at all Russian facilities is not allowed under the treaty. Moving into this past fall and winter, Russia also did not comply with the New START treaty obligation to convene a session of the treaty implementation body, the Bilateral Consultative Commission, the BCC, in accordance with the treaty mandated timeline. We did have a BCC session set for late November. Let me emphasize here that all the issues Russia identified for discussion were on our agenda. Delegation lists had been exchanged and both sides were prepared to get on planes and travel to the meeting. Unfortunately, Moscow pulled the plug on the meeting at the last minute and has not proposed another time. Russia has continued to assert that it is the United States that is not in compliance with the treaty, and that is not true. The United States remains in full compliance with the New START treaty, including the treaty's numerical limits. Russia has alleged concerns with respect to U.S. conversion of submarine launch ballistic missiles, SLBM, launchers, and heavy bombers. New START provides for inspections of converted items to confirm the results of conversions, and we have mutually identified a confidence-building measure to resolve Russia's concerns regarding the SLBM conversions. And we are prepared to implement that, but it does require Russian inspection at a relevant U.S. facility an available option, again, that Russia is currently choosing not to exercise. Again, the U.S. has remained ready to host Russian inspectors at U.S. facilities specifically so that Russia can verify the conversions, and we have been ready to engage in the BCC to discuss any implementation concerns Russia has under the treaty. 
Russia's non-compliance with inspection and BCC provisions is problematic. And President Putin's suspension of the treaty is not in anyone's interest. But the good news is that there are readily, these are readily fixable problems. Should Moscow choose to return to the benefits of transparency, stability, and nuclear risk reduction? Beyond the provisions of the treaty, Russia has now asserted that the security environment today is different than it was when New START was concluded. Uh, there is no arguing that point. The treaty was signed in 2010, prior to Russia's unprovoked and unlawful invasion of Ukraine in 2014, and its full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2021, 2022. It is Russia that launched without provocation an invasion of its neighbor. Far from fostering these unfavorable conditions, the United States actively worked to avoid them, including by holding an extraordinary session of the U.S.-Russian Strategic Stability Dialogue in January of 2022. The strong U.S. and international response to Russia's unprovoked full-scale invasion of Ukraine does not absolve Russia of its responsibility to fulfill its legal obligations under New START. And again, no Russian actions related to New START will stop us from supporting Ukraine. In his suspension announcement, Putin also invoked perceived nuclear threats from U.S. allies, and he raised the specter of nuclear testing. First, the nuclear arsenals of our allies existed in 2010 when we were negotiating New START, in 2021 when we extended the treaty. Russia understood this and nonetheless recognized the utility of New START for our bilateral relations and global stability. Second, on testing, no other nation except North Korea is engaged in threats about nuclear testing. So it seems the only reason Putin brought up the matter was to inject more fear into a pronouncement already intended to frighten. Overall, Putin's defense of a decision on New START suspension defies logic and reason. The United States will continue to aid Ukraine in the face of Russia's efforts to subjugate it. But that reality does not affect the utility of New START or Russia's ability to continue participation under the treaty. Transparency and predictability around strategic nuclear forces is good for bilateral and global stability, period. Putin was not forced to suspend participation. It was his choice, and he can and should reverse it. The United States remains ready to work constructively with Russia to fully implement New START. That is because we continue to view nuclear arms control as a means to strengthen U.S. ally and global security. And we will continue, and we encourage the international community to join us in emphasizing for Moscow the risks that this irresponsible decision poses for Russia. Certainly, nuclear arms control promotes stability that is predicated on predictability and transparency. But broader arms control measures can also reduce and help identify and address destabilizing activities. They can define responsible behavior so that the world can more clearly recognize irresponsible behavior to either avoid it or to hold accountable those responsible for it. And finally, by stabilizing regions and domains through transparency and accountability, arms control can prevent unnecessary and costly arms races and hopefully eventually allow for disarmament. Let me give you some examples of what we are working on to help stabilize the global geopolitical environment. I will start with the People's Republic of China. The PRC's rapid nuclear weapons buildup raises questions about its intent and policies and reinforces the importance of pursuing practical measures to reduce nuclear risks. Additionally, the PRC is developing and modernizing their conventional forces and counter space capabilities. While we will continue to maintain our abilities to defend against and to deter a range of threats to ourselves, our allies and partners, we also seek to engage the PRC on risk reduction through improved crisis communication, information sharing and measures of restraint, even more in important during this intensified period of competition and which again is deeply in the PRC's interest as well so they can avoid misunderstandings, miscalculations and misperceptions, especially in a world filled with false narratives. As I mentioned, we are also working with the international community to define what responsible behavior is, especially in gray zones, and regarding technologies that could have strategic effects. Outer space, for example, is an essential domain uh, driving prosperity and security for all states, whether in weather forecasting, position navigation and timing, or communications. 
The U.S. believes that the most practical near-term solutions to enhancing space stability and security include developing national security space-related norms of responsible behavior. One of the easiest and quickest ways to reduce threats to our astronauts and our space assets is to reduce the intentional creation of debris. That's why we worked in the United Nations General Assembly to adopt a resolution calling on states to commit not to conduct destructive, direct ascent ASAT missile testing. Despite Russian and Chinese opposition, 155 states voted yes on this resolution. Not only is this a demonstration of the inter international community's desire that such reckless acts never occur again, but is also the first of what we hope will be many more norms of responsible behavior to anticipate and address pressing threats to space security. In January, we submitted to the UN a proposal for new norms of responsible behavior, which we look forward to discussing with countries in the coming months. We see similar opportunities when it comes to emerging technologies. Artificial intelligence is a transformational, general purpose technology that has altered our ambitions and insights in positive ways. From a national security perspective, however, we want to ensure that we and all countries develop and use AI in our militaries in a responsible manner. Absent a consensus in this area, states may rush to harness AI without a careful approach and could deploy systems with unpredictable consequences. As Undersecretary Bonnie Jenkins said earlier this month when announcing the U.S. political declaration on responsible military use of artificial intelligence and autonomy, we have an obligation to create strong norms of responsible behavior concerning military uses of AI in a way that keeps in mind that applications of AI by militaries will undoubtedly change in the coming years. We believe that having states commit to these norms will help reduce risk while also effectively harnessing the benefits of such technologies. We look forward to continuing to work with partners to develop what responsible use of AI in the military arena looks like for the global community. Beyond AI, the Arms Control Bureau is looking at implications on strategic stability from technologies like quantum computing, geoengineering, and deepfakes. A key element in our approach, and indeed in many arms control arrangements, is being able to see and confirm and even demonstrate to the world what is happening regarding covered programs and technologies. We are constantly trying to improve our ability to collect, detect, deter, and verify. Our work includes technically focused practical efforts, such as the International Partnership for Nuclear Disarmament Verification, the IPNDV, which increases international capacity and awareness of verification issues critical to disarmament. The partnership focuses on practical hands-on activities like exercises and technical demonstrations, which allow the partners to test in realistic scenarios the verification processes, procedures, techniques, and technologies that we've developed over the last six years. Similarly, the Creating an Environment for Nuclear Disarmament, or SEND initiative, provides a space in which members can have frank, informal discussions that are integral to advancing the goal of nuclear risk reduction, arms control, and disarmament. The new voices and partners that we have heard from in both of these contexts have been crucial to our understanding of different threat perceptions, confidence building mechanisms, and even security challenges. In my position at the Arms Control Bureau at the U.S. State Department, I'm very familiar with the refrain that now is not the time for arms control. The logic behind that refrain is understandable. Arms control requires partners, and it is hard to think about cooperation when we are in the middle of one of the most significant challenges to European security since World War II. It is hard to think about how we sit down with Russian officials while their government persists in treaty noncompliance and while their, their forces engage in, in significant um, challenges to the civilian population committing war crimes on a daily basis. It can seem like we should focus all our efforts on overcoming challenges to alliance and partnership unity in the face of food, energy, and equipment shortages directly resulting from Russia's war against Ukraine. But those thoughts ignore the reality that if we cannot find ways to manage nuclear risks, then we must all, we will all face the results and the dangers together. The United States, our allies and partners, as well as Russia and all other nations must prevent this. This is exactly the time that we most need arms control. 
whether it is in the form of risk reduction, crisis communications, stabilization mechanisms such as confidence and security building measures, norm building, or legally binding agreements. History has repeatedly shown that when the risk of miscalculation is at its height, that is when the arms control toolkit can be most essential. The United States will not sit back and allow nuclear instability to metastasize. Whether through working to preserve New START to improve our defense posture, or to prepare the ground for future arms control arrangements, we will continue to do what our president has asked us to do, lead efforts to safeguard this country and the world from nuclear threats. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, thank you for your uh, very clear um, overview of Biden administration uh, reaction uh, to Putin's um, suspension of Russia's participation, and also your, the outlook mm -hmm. uh, you see for uh, arms control and risk reduction uh, going forward. Uh, I have some uh, of my own questions for you. Uh, we have a large uh, group of uh, uh, online viewers. Mm -hmm. uh, several of them have already submitted uh, questions, and I will weave their questions into our conversation. Uh, and then uh, uh, after uh, we've spoken for a while, I think we'll give our audience here in person and the online audience additional opportunities to pose uh, questions to you. And just a reminder, uh, if uh, our online audience wishes to pose questions, please uh, send them to events at brookings.edu and to tweet uh, at hashtag uh, new starts suspension. And you see the, uh, the, uh, the, the address uh, up, up on the screen. So <clears throat> let, me, let me start by saying, um, do, do we really have a clear idea uh, of the activities that uh, Russia intends to suspend uh, under uh, Putin's uh, announcement. I mean, it, it is clear they're still not going to permit inspections, you know, on their territory. Uh, the Russian Foreign Ministry uh, issued a statement uh, in which it said they will continue to abide by the quantitative limitations of New START. Uh, and uh, they also said they will continue to provide uh, notifications of launches of SLB submarine launch ballistic missiles and ICBMs uh, in accordance with a uh, Soviet era, uh, U.S. Soviet uh, 1988 uh, agreement. Uh, but uh, to my knowledge, they've, they haven't said anything about all of the notifications, the data exchanges, all of that. Uh, which gives us uh, give us a uh, a much clearer understanding of uh, uh, Russian strategic uh, activities. Um, you mentioned that we have approached the Russians uh, to try to get answers. Have we gotten any clarification? What's your uh, your assessment of the activities that uh, they're going to suspend? So aside from the information that you just recounted, we haven't received any formal notifications. Um, uh, with respect to the treaty that suspends um, additional notifications, right? So we're following, as you are, what um, the Russian government has said uh, through its, uh, you know, speeches and communications beyond the formal treaty notification process. Um, the suspension hasn't been officially effective yet in the sense that we're still receiving notifications as recently as today under the treaty, regular notifications. But we expect that as soon as that suspension has been formalized, that those will stop um, pursuant to what we've heard um, from our Russian colleagues. So we're trying to follow up with them to truly understand what else could be included um, in the suspension and what could be continued. Um, but right now, we expect it will just be the launch notifications under that 1988 agreement, um, and that they said they will abide by the actual numerical limitations. Um, um, uh, uh, whatever they're prepared to do, uh, is the Biden administration prepared to continue 
uh, providing the um, New START mandated notifications regardless mm -hmm. uh, of what the Russians do. Yeah. We're looking at the available options right now. I think it really will depend how this um, suspension is affected, how it moves forward, uh, what the reasons that they actually formally provide us for it, and what they end up providing in terms of information. I think, you know, we're not sure. Right now it's very much an open question since we haven't seen their formal notification. Uh, so we need to figure out what we're going to be able to do once we understand what they're intending to do. Uh, we have a question on this uh, subject from an online, mm -hmm. an online uh, audience member. Uh, it's David uh, Wishard of the Government Accountability Office, uh, and he asks whether Russia's suspension, um, perhaps of these notifications, we don't know how extensive they will be, uh, but whether Russia's suspension uh, will reduce the ability of the United States uh, to acquire uh, critical information affecting U.S. Uh, security. Uh, you know, c can the United States get what it needs uh, through its own national technical means, uh, through open sources, uh, through uh, other methods of gathering information? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, of course, you don't know the extent of, uh, of their suspension, uh, but are we concerned that we're going to lose track uh, regarding Russian strategic activities? So, you know, as we've been arguing um, to Russia, and as we made the case clearly when we discussed their noncompliance, inspections are crucial for both countries. Um, and the BCC, which is set up to discuss implementation questions and compliance concerns, is crucial as well to be able to allow for the continuing functioning of the treaty. So those two elements that had already been um, not complied with by Russia's behavior before this announced suspension have already impacted our ability truly to implement the treaty, impacted our ability to understand what's going on on the ground. I think further, again, depending on what they end up providing in terms of notifications under the suspension, um, further diminishment of informa information from a transparency uh, structure that the treaty provides for will, will not be helpful to the stability uh, and security of, of either side. And that's really what we're trying to sort of understand here, is that it's in Russian interest as well to receive this information from us, just as it's in our interest to receive the information from them on a reciprocal basis. You mentioned that the State Department issued a finding a couple of weeks ago that uh, Russia was not complying with some uh, important uh, New START uh, obligations, uh, in particular to uh, to allow to facilitate inspections on their territory, uh, to meet uh, in the New START implementation body, the uh, BCC. Mm -hmm. uh, but in response uh, to the State Department's uh, charges, uh, the uh, Russians have come back and said the United States is in material breach of its New START obligations. And you mentioned uh, Russian concerns about uh, its ability to come to the United States for inspection. You also mentioned concerns about conversion, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, which is this very serious accusation because uh, you know, uh, you know, conversion uh, done right ensures that a country abides by its quantitative limitations. Mm -hmm. And essentially, uh, the Russians are raising the question of whether the United States is abiding by the, yeah. uh, by the treaty's uh, limits. Could you explain a little bit the conversion issue? What, what are they concerned about? Mm -hmm. what, what American systems mm -hmm. do they believe we're not converting appropriately? Yeah, so as I mentioned, it's the SLBM launchers and the heavy bombers that they're concerned we haven't converted sufficiently to not allow them um, to be included essentially under the new cap, um, under the new start limitation. So they want to ensure that the heavy bombers can't carry, right, once they're converted, they can't carry nuclear weapons and similar limitations about the SLBM launchers. I will say that we had worked out a transpar transparency and confidence building measure with the Russians that only needs an inspection of the SLBM launchers to allow them to confirm that it addresses their concerns. So in other words, they're alleging that we are breaching the treaty, but they're not allowing us to show them how we are not breaching the treaty, which uh, the inspection provisions in the BCC are specifically set up 
to address these kind of questions. Um, so we've worked out a TCBM with them. They're not taking advantage of the inspection uh, right, and, and we're encouraging them to do so to confirm that we can demonstrate this conversion um, is sufficient and, and establishes um, that, that our, our, uh, our equipment cannot be used for purposes that we're you know, prohibited from using it. So there's a, there's a path forward. And they should take advantage of inspections, and they should allow um, you know, their inspectors to confirm that these conversions are sufficient. But without inspections and without continuing BCCs, we can't establish the continuing operation in the manner that they're suggesting we need to do. So it's really a, a catch-22, in a sense, that they're accusing us of being in violation, yet they're not taking advantage of their right to confirm that we are doing the right thing. Okay. You mentioned, Mallory, uh, nuclear testing. Mm -hmm. The, uh, Putin actually said uh, that Russia uh, could resume uh, nuclear testing uh, if the United States resumed nuclear testing. Th this kind of came out of the blue. Uh, you know, uh, to my knowledge, no one in the U.S. government is talking about resuming nuclear testing. So why did, why did Putin raise this uh, uh, issue? Uh, it, you know, it, it, was it simply a political, you know, m more nuclear scaremongering? Uh, or was it, um, you know, some indication that Russia itself is considering the resumption of nuclear testing? What, how, how, did, how was this read in the U.S. government? Yeah, I mean, we were scratching our heads about that as well. We didn't understand where it came from. Um, I think we have sort of kicked around all of the ideas that you've mentioned. But, you know, we definitely settled on, as I mentioned, a, a consensus that to the extent that the suspension announcement was destabilizing and intended to um, cause some degree of fear that maybe adding in the nuclear testing would further sort of um, lend strength to, you know, President Putin's efforts to destabilize and to sort of grow concerns in the international community about this decision. Okay. So uh, the Russians have said uh, in a number of ways that uh, the New START suspension is reversible. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the other hand, they say that as long as the United States and the West uh, seek uh, Russia's strategic defeat, uh, there can't be a return to business as usual. In light of this, what, what are the prospects um, for uh, engaging with Russia now? Whether it's uh, resuming the uh, strategic stability dialogue that was suspended because of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, whether it's uh, rescheduling the BCC meeting that uh, the Russians abruptly canceled at the last minute, uh, or whether it's uh, uh, beginning negotiations on a uh, follow-on agreement that would replace New START when it expires in February 2026. And you know, in, in that connection, we also have a question uh, online. This one comes from Ed Levine uh, of the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation. Um, he, he, you know, Ed believes uh, that the Russian uh, suspension uh, was not nearly as extensive as it could have been. Mm -hmm. uh, and he asks whether this suggests that Russia still understands the need uh, for uh, arms control. And, and I'll add to Ed's uh, question. Um, the Russian Foreign Ministry uh, stated that New START's contribution to strengthening international security and strategic stability has not been exhausted. Uh, what does all this mean uh, for prospects of uh, negotiations on a New START follow-on? Are, are the Russians still interested in arms control? So we very much hope so. It's obviously in their uh, domestic interest and in our interest and in the global um, security interest for us to continue to have these discussions. We have obligations under our international commitments to try to find ways to reduce nuclear risk and to stabilize um, uh, the, the, the global environment. And so, you know, what we have said, what President Putin um, sort of has, has, has reminded the community is that the U.S. government is willing to meet on arms control with Russia. Um, the, you know, President Biden has said it, uh, Secretary Blinken just recently said it last week, we will meet with them. Um, we need to meet with them. It's, it's, it's something that both countries need to do to continue to focus on international stability and risk reduction. Um, the context in which we meet now is, is, is 
is sort of up to, to a certain degree, available mechanisms, right? If Russia is not allowing the BCC to continue, is there another context in which, you know, we can meet in a good faith context to have these conversations? And that's what's so troubling is that, you know, the, the, the communications we've heard from Putin seem to place in doubt the assumptions that we've already always had that they do value arms control and they've demonstrated this value um, for decades. I think by tying it to Ukraine right now, tying it to an immovable um, object in the sense that our support for Ukraine will not be limited by their New START decision, they're really um, placing in doubt their support for the treaty itself. And so trying to figure out um, how we come to the table and talk about next steps in, in, in arms control and, and what we need to talk about right now with respect to New START is challenging, but we're willing to do it and we need to have good faith partners to join us on this. And we've been communicating this to Russia, again, through our president, through the Secretary of State, uh, through Undersecretary Jenkins as recently as, as today. Um, we have said we are willing to meet on this. We just need to understand you know, where these communications are coming from, what the intent behind the communications um, that, that Putin has most recently put out are, and, and how we address our obligations moving forward um, to reduce nuclear risk. So yes, we are ready. We just need to understand what context in which we'll be able to meet with them. And as, as our president has said, we require a good faith partner to sort of figure out how we can push forward in this arena. Okay, let, let's say the Russians do agree to sit down and talk to us, and they're prepared to consider um, replacing a New START with a follow-on arrangement. Has the Biden administration already decided what its objectives are <clears throat> for a, a follow-on agreement? Um, the, the Trump administration had talked about um, uh, one limit uh, regarding all nuclear weapons, deployed, non-deployed, strategic, non-strategic, and so forth. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, the U.S. Congress, um, in uh, ratifying New START, uh, expressed its strong uh, desire that a follow-on agreement deal with non-strategic systems uh, in which uh, Russia's assumed to have a large advantage. Uh, the uh, Biden administration, I don't think, has said on the record, uh, but there have been discussions, uh, I, I believe, uh, about having an aggregate of all nuclear weapons. Uh, could you give us a sense, ha has the Biden administration adopted an approach, a framework uh, for pursuing a follow-on agreement? And you, could you share some of its elements with us? So I think we should be clear that the first step to any discussion of follow-on to New START requires compliance with New START. And I think that's the point um, that we've been trying to make uh, you know, this week, last week, um, and, and even um, all of January when we're discussing Russian non-compliance, which has been, again, continuing um, since they failed to allow inspections and they um, failed to engage in a BCC. We need to implement New START to be able to figure out how to push beyond New START. Um, but you're correct, we're thinking about all of these things. We have been talking about trying to more comprehensively address um, the Russian strategic stockpile, including um, their, their, their large amount of tactical nuclear weapons. Um, we are taking into account the existing uh, challenges in the, in the global community. We're looking at this all through the integrated deterrence approach um, that our, um, our Department of Defense has been discussing. You know, we're not, we're not looking at this in a vacuum, but we need compliance with New START first, and that's really the struggle right now is to understand um, how we bring Russia back um, into compliance and how they truly understand why it's in their interest to comply. Um, so, you know, before we get ahead of ourselves, that's the question that we're really trying to address right now. Okay, let, let's, assuming, let's assume we, we can get over that mm -hmm. hurdle. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, you seem to be saying that uh, the administration has looked at this idea of uh, trying to uh, limit all nuclear weapons. Uh, that poses new challenges, especially uh, verification. Uh, simply uh, uh, verifying that the Russians have limited their non-strategic weapons also involves significant challenges. How far are we in, uh, and, and our partners internationally, and you mentioned this uh, multilateral uh, consideration of these issues, how far are we in being able to get a handle on these problems 
and, and if certain elements of a new agreement uh, can be verified with high confidence, is there some way of segregating those issues and dealing with them in some fashion and dealing with the more verifiable elements separately? Yeah, I mean, you're right to point out that this doesn't have, have to be all done in one fell swoop. Um, and you're right to point out the verification challenges, the significant verification challenges that all of these um, sort of issues will represent, especially in an environment in which, you know, uh, we're walking away from traditional instruments of arms control and, and, and traditional verification architecture. So, you know, through um, a lot of our multilateral efforts, the IPNDV and the CEND also working um, with the Stockholm Initiative to understand what the concerns are, what the capacities are, uh, where technologies could be developed, um, what we continue to um, hear from, from um, partners, but also new voices to sort of explain what their concerns are. We're trying to take it all in, but understand we're not, we're not inflexibly looking at one tool or another tool. We're trying to consider everything that's available to us in, in restraining um, you know, the, the strategic capacities uh, that we're dealing with. And I think, you know, I think, again, we should also figure out what's happening in the broader community, looking to the PRC, uh, looking to um, our P5 meetings to understand what, what can be done in that context. We're really looking across the board to address a lot of these really challenging issues. I have another online question. This one from uh, John Wolfstall of uh, Global Zero. Uh, John uh, is a former senior director at the NSC for uh, arms control and nonproliferation, which is the job you had beca before becoming a State Department assistant secretary. Uh, John notes that President Reagan uh, declared that the United States would abide by the limits of the unratified SALT II Treaty as long as Moscow did the same. Uh, John asks, uh, would the Biden administration consider something like the uh, Reagan approach, uh, abiding by New START, uh, as long as Russia did the same? You know, what, what I've been trying to say here is that nothing is necessarily off the table, but we do need to understand Russian intents here. We need to understand what they're willing to do. Um, we have been reaching out to try to hear from them further to understand their position. But, you know, I think John's point is well made that the, there is flexibility in how we can approach some of these issues as long as we are confident that they can be approached in a verifiable manner and confident that they're in our national security interests. Um, so, you know, as long as we could hear from Russia what they would be interested in engaging in, but to even get to that point, we really do need to have compliance with New START and an understanding that New START is in our bilateral interests and the global security interests. So working through New START to sort of next steps is, is the path that we think is the most productive. So we can reestablish the, the, the functioning uh, process of, of the last remaining nuclear arms control treaty between us. I mean, you know, even if Russia had not invaded Ukraine, mm -hmm. uh, even if Russian uh, U.S. relations had not deteriorated to the extent that they have deteriorated, uh, there would have been all kinds of complications uh, in working out a follow-on. Uh, U.S. and Russian positions simply differ in a number of uh, important respects on uh, the treatment of uh, missile defenses, on uh, Russian concerns about uh, American uh, precision-guided, uh, long-range, uh, conventional uh, missiles and so forth. Uh, could you um, uh, focus on some of those complications and what uh, the U.S. attitude would be in dealing with them? Yeah, I mean, listen, it was going to be a hard negotiation anyway, um, for sure, and I think everyone recognized that. I think it's made even more difficult now, of course. Um, but you know, there, there is a fundamental understanding that it, at least there had been a fundamental understanding, it's in our collective interest to actually engage in these discussions. And so, you know, with respect to the Russian focus on U.S. missile defense or, uh, you know, uh, prompt global strike and, and, and our focus on 
uh, Russia's large stockpile of tactical weapons, there are different things for us to talk about and focus on. Um, and, and that's recognized. That said, we don't have to be limited to, um, you know, one instrument or another or, um, you know, we don't have to be looking at this through a, a, a pure legally binding if there's stuff to do in the non-binding context. Um, and so these are hard discussions, but we, we should figure out sort of how we implement New START and then how we move from New START to the broader conversation. I think establishing some degree to implement the treaty that was you know, reconfirmed in 2021 and extended for five years by Russia, understanding from them why um, you know, their invasion of Ukraine has so drastically changed the situation um, doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't make sense to us when they you know, have been confirming its importance. Uh, and their diplomats have been saying how New START is valuable. So we need to understand where they're coming from, what they're looking for, and what's in our own uh, national interest in proceeding. Um, here's another question coming in uh, online. It's from Peter Metz of the Massachusetts Peace Action Nuclear Disarmament Working Group. Mm -hmm. uh, and Peter Metz uh, asks uh, whether it's time uh, to start anew uh, to, uh, to eliminate all nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And I would add, uh, or uh, is Obama's vision of a world without nuclear weapons dead, uh, or at least uh, pushed to an even more distant uh, aspirational future? You know, I think, I think one of the biggest challenges we have right now is that if, if one country with nuclear weapons is pushing towards you know, global zero, and no other country with nuclear weapons takes the same approach. It's not a very realistic uh, outlook, right? It's not also stabilizing. And I think we need to figure out how to move towards, uh, you know, our, our Article 6 obligations in a stabilizing, coherent, and sustainable way versus an all-or-nothing approach. Um, you know, I think what we see from Russia right now when they're claiming that, you know, our assertion of, of um, the need to have a strategic defeat of Russia and Ukraine somehow changes um, the environment for arms control is just not credible. And it, it's, it's an excuse that is challenging, especially where Secretary Blinken has said, if Russia stopped fighting in Ukraine, they could go home and live their lives as, as usual, normal, and, and everything would proceed apace. But if Ukraine stopped fighting in Ukraine, they would cease to exist. It's a very different situation. So, you know, the challenge is that if you have one country threatening another country's very existence, claiming that's the reason they can't engage in arms control, it, it, it really challenges our ability to move forward with them credibly. And so we really need to understand, and they need to understand, why both New START and the broader arms control architecture, you know, in the multilateral context across the board is in their own interest, stabilizes uh, their own security. Um, as well as the global communities. And I just think that's the overarching problem. And you can't sort of say this is the reason that we need to get rid of all nuclear weapons because you will never hear anyone in Russia or, or, or elsewhere or China saying that that's what they want to do right now. Um, and I just think it's not credible to say that's the path forward at this very moment. Um, Mallory, many uh, experts believe that the likelihood uh, that nuclear weapons will be used now uh, either intentionally or as a result of miscalculation, uh, misperception, um, that the likelihood has substantially increased uh, in recent years. So uh, should uh, traditional arms control, meaning uh, uh, limiting the numbers and capabilities of nuclear forces, uh, should that now take a, a back seat to reducing the risks of nuclear war? Um, and uh, if we should be giving uh, priority uh, to risk reduction measures, uh, what are some of the risk reduction measures we have in mind? You mentioned transparency as one, confidence building. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have in mind some specific um, uh, confidence building and transparency steps that we would put to the Russians and perhaps the Chinese and others as well? Mm -hmm. So when I think of arms control, I think actually broadly of risk reduction. Um, but when you mention traditional arms control, I think of sort of the treaty structures, the architectures that have been around for many years. And I think um, we should look across the board for what can be helpful right now. And as I mentioned in, 
in the outer space arena, we've been working on norms development, just as we've been doing in AI and military uses. Because any stabilizing efforts with the multilateral community, even if Russia is not participating, will help lay the groundwork for understanding what other countries are doing, uh, preventing miscommunication and miscalculation. Um, you know, when we see this increasing environment of, of uh, potential destabilization, um, by losing these arms control instruments. That is when we need to look more broadly at stabilizing activities. And again, norms development, uh, transparency and confidence building measures, understanding what good and responsible behavior is in these gray zones so that we can clarify where bad behavior is occurring. And we've seen this kind of effort be effective. Um, thinking about uh, the efforts that the United States government um, took to highlight uh, the ASAT testing that the Chinese government did in 2007 um, were enough to change its behavior so that its subsequent test of the same ASAT did not create as much debris. And the debris from the 2007 anti-satellite test will continue to be around uh, for decades to come. So trying to stabilize the environment, prevent the heightened tension um, and the miscommunication that exists, even with Russia not part of that uh, normative framework, will help sort of clarify the behavior that's existing. So our efforts are going to be risk reduction, which again, in my mind, is part of arms control, but it'll be broadly across the strategic domain, including space, including AI, including technologies that implicate our strategic uh, capacities, and also with nuclear responsible behavior. As we, as we discussed in the NPT context, there is a large amount of responsible behavior that nuclear states can follow, and we hope that everyone will follow that. Is the, is the era of formal, legally binding arms control agreements over? Mm -hmm. Are we now into an area of uh, normative uh, arms control? You mentioned uh, space, cyber, uh, AI, and so forth. These are issues where um, you know, rapidly uh, changing technologies, uh, where problems of verification, even problems of definition, uh, make it difficult to, for, to formulate um, traditional kinds of arms control measures. Are we into a new era now? Is, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, or, you know, are, are START, comprehensive test ban, these kinds, of, are they things of the past now? I hope not. Um, I think we should still support them absolutely, right? The arms control structures that we have through the NPT, uh, through the Chemical Weapons Convention, all crucially remain important and will continue to be important. Um, I think we should also do the normative exercises, and I think uh, they can be helpful in defining terminology that leads to illegally binding, right? That's the exciting thing about um, the normative work in the um, you know, emerging and disruptive technology arena is that you can help define terminology that can eventually be embodied, hopefully, in a legally binding treaty when everyone comes to a common um, understanding and agreement as to what that terminology means. And we, we saw the evolution of arms control um, proceed that way historically, right? It, with respect to the Outer Space Treaty, there was UN work prior to the Outer Space Treaty that laid the normative underpinnings for our agreements and our understandings of why it's not a good idea to place weapons of mass destruction in orbit or on celestial bodies. And eventually that was codified into a legally binding agreement. So I, I, I mean, maybe it's because I have to stay positive that I refuse to say that the, you know, the the time of, of legally binding arms control structures is done. Um, I think, you know, we cannot predict the future, but we should certainly work toward establishing the ability to to enter into those uh, to our, um, you know, U.S. national security interests and to the global security interests. In, in your introductory remarks, you mentioned the. Uh, rapidly growing Chinese nuclear threat. Mm -hmm. Now, my understanding is that the Biden administration has reached out multiple times uh, to China uh, and sought to engage in some kind of discussions, uh, a, a strategic stability dialogue analogous to what uh, the Biden administration began to do with, with Russia. Uh, but these uh, efforts to reach out to the Chinese have been rebuffed uh, every every time. Mm -hmm. uh, so w w what's the plan uh, for engaging with uh, China? Um, you know, China is a uh, permanent member of the Security Council. 
Uh, it's a uh, party to the non-proliferation treaty with an obligation to pursue uh, mm -hmm. arms control and disarmament. So how, how, how does the United States get China uh, to the table? And uh, if the U.S. could get China to the table, what would be on the U.S. agenda? Yeah, I mean, we have to work with China um, so that, you know, both of us understand it's in our mutual interest to engage in risk reduction efforts, so that China understands in their interest uh, to have these conversations, to prevent miscalculation and miscommunication. Certainly this last month, um, you know, with all the discussion and, and misunderstandings about what was happening in our near, near space atmosphere, it would have been helpful to have more lines of communication set up. Um, to, to be able to reach out very quickly. These are the kind of moments in which you try to emphasize that communication is helpful, that preventing miscalculation um, is, is something that's in their own interest. And so, you know, one of the very positive interactions that, um, that I was able to participate in with, with the Chinese government in, in, under the Obama administration was a space security dialogue restarting, you know, um, these dialogues to understand, uh, you know, mutual threat perceptions, understanding what's happening in this space security arena that impact uh, collective uh, challenges uh, for all of us and our space assets and astronauts. Um, these are in, in, in China's interest, especially, as well as our own. Having, uh, you know, some sort of additional channels of communication between our militaries, um, as, as we had historically trying to work on potential launch notifications to prevent miscommunication, um, which I know China has with other countries. <clears throat> These are all options that, that are very much in Chinese interest. And so really working to understand what the realm of the possible is in terms of engagements and, and getting them to appreciate why these are in their interest is something that we're working on right now. And, and you know, I think I, I think it can't be underestimated that the domestic benefit of having risk reduction in place, arms control mechanisms and risk reduction, transparency and confidence building measures can't be overstated. And we just have to sort of look through the political challenges um, that I think all countries right now, or many countries, are struggling with because of this misnomer that arms control is not in the domestic interest. Uh, we, we're clearly approaching a world now uh, sooner or later, we're going to have two uh, uh, nuclear peer competitors, both Russia and, uh, and now China. And there are experts uh, who, who say that in such a world, uh, uh, new, the, you know, new Start would be too constraining, uh, that in order to deter both China and Russia, the United States would have to field uh, nuclear forces um, that exceed the limitations of New Star. Uh, what uh, w uh, could, could you share with us, administration uh, thinking about how we're going to deal with two peer nuclear competitors, and we can we manage to deter them um, uh, by maintaining New Star kinds of level or even lower levels? Where uh, has uh, the China factor? really said, okay, no more reductions. Uh, we can't afford to do that anymore and still have uh, high quality deterrence. Yeah, I mean, as our national security strategy said, we're very aware of approaching this time in which we have two near peer or peer competitors in the strategic arena. Um, and it's something that we're very much thinking about. Uh, and, and there's, um, you know, considerations going across the board. I think it's very active in our integrated deterrence approach to understand how we are able to, you know, defend and deter aggression against ourselves and, and our allies and partners. And I think that's an active conversation you all can expect is going on and you've seen in the press as well. Um, but, you know, what we need to get our heads around is how we maintain the existing structure. So again, how we, how we bring New START back. Um, in, and how we ensure that Russia sees it in their interest because it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me to say that because we're concerned about additional threats beyond Russia, we should not, you know, stay in a stabilizing and, and security enhancing treaty with Russia. And so trying to figure out how to make sure we maintain New START but also address additional challenges is very much actively being discussed. Um, you know, I, I, 
can defer to many others more intimately involved in our integrated deterrence strategies and approach. But uh, from my perspective, I've seen you know all sorts of considerations and all sorts of um, sort of uh, defensive capacities being discussed and making sure that we are able to to continue to defend ourselves is at the top. So uh, arms control has always been controversial politically uh, in the United States. Uh, but despite all the controversy, both uh, Republican and Democratic administrations uh, have managed to gain approval uh, for legally binding um, arms control treaties. Um, but is that still possible in today's hyper-partisan uh, political climate uh, in the United States? Uh, what, what are, more generally, what are the implications of hyper-partisanship for the future of arms control? Yeah, it's, it's a challenge. It's certainly a challenge. I think we've seen the erosion of um, a knowledge set about how important arms control is to domestic security. Um, and, and the political arena has suggested somehow that negotiations on arms control are um, somehow more beneficial to our partners in those negotiations than they are to ourselves. And I think uh, that, again, reflects a political narrative that isn't accurate. I think um, what we have seen, of course, is that walking away from arms control structures, um, including the JCPOA, ha have not been to our advantage. Um, and, and we need to ensure that, uh, you know, on a bipartisan basis, it's understood why these need to continue and why need, we need to work um, to, to establish more stability uh, through risk reduction. Um, and we will continue to work on that, of course, regardless of the political environment. Um, but from, from my perspective, the, the challenges we face uh, from strategic stability and, and nuclear risks are not a four or even an eight year challenge. And I think making sure everyone appreciates that these are beyond the U.S. political cycle is, is, is an important message for everyone to convey. So it is a challenge, and I think we should all work on it. And we've heard from our partners and allies and, and, and that they very much want us to work on it. And I think we need to continue um, through this path. I, I am fascinated by the sort of arms control is dead concept. It doesn't die. It's a tool. It's a stabilizing mechanism. It's not like you can kill it. Um, it needs to be available, and it needs to continue to operate as, as a functioning um, and, 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 and even as a possible um, mechanism to help moving forward. And you shouldn't say, for now and all time, arms control is dead, or for now and all time, we can immediately jump into a treaty. I think both positions are, are not necessarily reflective of reality. So that's what we're working on with our partners and, and with the Hill and, and more, more broadly. Okay, we have about 15 minutes left. We have some time for questions uh, uh, from the audience, more questions uh, uh, online. So uh, please, uh, uh, when I call on you, please uh, t uh, state your name, tell us your affiliation, and then pose a, uh, a, a short question. So uh, uh, Amy, we start with you. Great, thanks so much. Hi, Mallory. Thanks so much for being here today. A um, couple questions. The last time we were in a, a, an analogous situation with the Russians in INF treaty compliance, um, the U.S. subsequently withdrew. Is there any merit to the idea that Putin is pushing the U.S. to similarly withdraw from New START? And then on near space, are you suggesting that it would it ideally would follow a similar pattern as outer space with lots of discussions of norms and notifications leading to a treaty? Or is a legally binding treaty just not on the horizon? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Amy. I, um, clearly, uh, with respect to the INF model, um, you know, there was a path followed in that context um, that led to the demise of the treaty. In this context, we are very much hoping to encourage Russia to return to compliance. And we're very much hoping um, uh, that the international community helps us make this message that New START is in all of our interests and, and, and an obligation on the U.S. and Russia to um, uh, proceed in these stabilizing uh, conversations. So, you know, I, I can't uh, at this point say there's a there's a necessary path forward because we're gaining information as to what Russia intended by a suspension and what the suspension will entail. Um, 
but you know the options on the table for us are across the board and I think it would be very um, unfortunate for for national and international security if New Start went away um, but you know at this point again without more information it's hard to say the path forward um, but certainly we are encouraging um, Russia to engage with us in conversations about these issues on um, so your second question, I would just say we need more information, and that's what we're in the process of doing right now, is gathering information about um, both domestic requirements for notifications, but also international requirements, um, understanding uh, what is happening um, in the near space domain uh, across the board internationally so that we're not unilaterally taking steps, um, but really understanding you know, who's doing what and who's notifying whom. Um, because a lot of this is, is not um, it's not state actor necessarily. Some of it's non-state actor, and you know, in the in the weather forecasting arena, this this capacity is utilized frequently. But also, as we've seen, uh, the intel gathering has has been happening um, by China and others. And I think we just need to understand what's happening internationally um, uh, before we sort of lock in even a normative approach, so that we can do so in a way that incorporates um, you know the general practice and the information that's already out there. Daryl. Hi there. Uh, Daryl Kimball, Arms Control Association. Thanks, Mallory. Um, the day after Russia's suspension announcement, the Chinese Foreign Ministry made a statement that said that New START is an important bilateral treaty on nuclear disarmament, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, China uh, encouraged the two sides to resolve their differences through constructive dialogue and consultation to ensure the treaty's sound implementation. So what's your analysis of China's reasoning behind uh, making a clear and strong statement uh, in support of New START and the timing? And what is the State Department or the administration doing to share its message about uh, the back and forth about uh, Russia's uh, misinformation about, about why they withdrew and uh, why it's important to return to the negotiating table? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I can only assume China's intent, um, but of course they see, they see the importance of New START to global stability, right? It's been mentioned in the NPT arena multiple times. Um, uh, it's been discussed in the P5 context. New START as a bilateral treaty implicates world security. Um, and, I, and, and that, you know, presumably is why the Chinese government supports it and hopes it comes back into um, force, well it's in force, but comes back, that Russia comes back into compliance as soon as possible. So I thought the Chinese comments were, were helpful um, and hopefully uh, Russia is listening um, to both China and the international community that see the suspension as destabilizing. Um, with respect to sharing communications, generally, you know, Historically, New Star communications have been in the classified context. So um, that sort of was, uh, I think, overlooked um, when some communications about the BCC and the inspections were, were made public um, uh, during the time that that happened, uh, primarily by the Russian government, but then we responded. So we're trying to correct the record when it becomes public, but we really are trying to engage with Russia behind the scenes to understand what their thinking is on this and what, what it means. Um, and we will, of course, be public with this communication when we need to correct the record as we felt we needed to today. And, you know, as Secretary Blinken, uh, Undersecretary Jenkins, and even uh, President Biden have discussed um, New START specifically in the last week. Um, but we're trying to understand from Russia directly without necessarily going through a very public channel unless, unless we have to correct the record. The, you mentioned just now, Mallory, the uh, P5 mm -hmm. forum. Mm -hmm. the, these are the five permanent members of the Security Council uh, who are also uh, the uh, legitimate nuclear weapon states under the uh, Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. Uh, they have met um, regularly um, to talk about uh, NPT issues in preparation for uh, non-proliferation treaty review conferences and so forth. So their agenda has mostly been about NPT issues, but it also has gotten into issues like um, nuclear doctrine and, and so forth. Um, does this forum, I mean, when, when it's been so difficult to organize bilateral discussions, especially with the Chinese, 
Uh, does this uh, forum of the five permanent members provide an opportunity uh, to engage multilaterally or on the sidelines of such engagement to engage bilaterally? Uh, is this something the Biden administration is pursuing? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, the P5 expert letter level discussion has been extremely important to share policies, um, to share nuclear doctrine, to address um, threat perceptions, to really understand um, you know, how the, the, the P5 countries are looking at these issues. So it has been very important, and we have pursued it quite actively um, as, as an, a stabilizing opportunity, as a risk reduction um, context in which we can engage with all five countries um, to, to be clear uh, on elements where there could be misperception and misunderstanding. So, you know, we hope it will continue, and we have found it very beneficial. Um, and, you know, I think also an important fulfillment of an obligation that we have to work towards uh, reducing nuclear risk um, in the NPT context. So, so I actually think it's, it's very positive. And even in this context of, of Russia's noncompliance with New START, these kind of P5 conversations have to continue. Yes, gentleman in the back. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Hiro Watanabe uh, from uh, Japanese newspaper uh, Sankei Shinbun. Um, my question is about um, G G7 summit in Hiroshima uh, in this May. Uh, Prime Minister Kishida, uh, as a politician uh, from Hiroshima, uh, he is willing to uh, uh, raise uh, nuclear um, control and the NPT treaty uh, as a key issue in G G7 summit. So the United States, uh, how do you uh, expect uh, G7 and the Japanese leadership uh, can convey a strong message to the world and how the how, uh, by the administration can cooperate to do that? Thank you. Yeah, we're working very closely um, with our G7 partners and with the Japanese government on taking advantage of you know, the location of the G7 summit and certainly the advantage of um, the Japanese government's strong leadership on arms control, non-proliferation, risk reduction, and truly understanding the dangers of, of nuclear risk. So it's, it, it is a very good opportunity to raise awareness uh, globally um, uh, from the, the, the personal and the political experience um, that the G7 meeting um, can, can convey. And so you're right to ask about it. It's, it's a good awareness raising context. It's a good um, sort of unification moment in which we can all appreciate why we need to work uh, towards reducing nuclear risk. Um, and so I'm very much looking forward to continuing positive communications um, from that group, but also um, you know, to see how we can develop even further in this responsible behavior. Yeah. We only have uh, about five minutes left, so why don't we take the remaining questions here, here, and here. Three more, um, if that's okay with you, Mallory. Take them, and then you can uh, answer those questions and sum up. Okay. Great, thanks. Uh, Jeff Price, Johns Hopkins, SICE. Um, Two questions. One, in Putin's speech on the 21st, he reflected this sort of visceral uh, aversion he has to on-site inspection. He's done it before in the non nuclear context and elsewhere. So, uh, and he basically talked about Engels Air Base, where they've launched attacks from without saying Engels Air Base. So first question is, um, how can we insulate, without giving an inch on the Ukraine attack, insulate the, what's going on there from the verification uh, regime for strategic arms control. And second, uh, the INF Treaty having been terminated, there's still unilateral moratoria in place with us and the Russians. And there were talks about increasing the specificity of that, maybe increasing the verification of that. Obviously, it's not a great time, but I wonder if there's any thoughts about the prospects for sort of solidifying and making more specific the regime uh, on INF intermediate range missiles in Europe. Could mm -hmm. you pass to the gentleman next to you? Yeah. Right. Hi, my name is uh, Austin Bogen, and correspondent from Norwegian National Broadcasting. Um, we're seeing periodically statements out of the Kremlin, different uh, sort of political figures, most notably perhaps Deputy Chairman of the Security Council of Russia, Dmitry Medvedev, 
basically saber rattling with nuclear uh, arms, you know, uh, what they could do with it and what they have. How do you tie those statements into, you know, arms control in general and specifically to their suspension on the start? Do you take them seriously? Okay. And gentlemen back, back there, yeah. Hello, I'm Max from Munich, Germany, and I'm working for the Hans Seidel Foundation. And I got a question regarding the Munich Security Conference. So um, the message is clear, and the West stands together. I think this year was the biggest US delegation at the Munich Security Conference. Um, the biggest cri criticism of such events like this conference is that there is so little outcome and no real decisions. <clears throat> I'm always wondering, um, so war is one of the most sensitive topics you can talk about, and um, how much happens behind the scenes and is not published to the public. Okay, well, so I'm gonna make sure I um, try to remember all these questions, but starting with the last one first, a lot happens behind the scenes, right? I think one of my EUR colleagues um, described um, the Munich Security Conference as just the, the quickest way to talk to so many countries on a bilateral basis on the sidelines um, and, and to really have the communications um, more directly by all being there. So it's usually positive even if uh, much of the positive progress made in that context isn't public or doesn't actually sort of um, doesn't get reflected in a tangible document or even a tangible commitment but I think the, the benefit of, of everyone meeting and, and having a, a huge like-minded presence in trying to work against um, the, the, the destabilizing environment um, that Russia's invasion has continued. But again, it's, it's, a, it's a positive opportunity uh, for continuing to make sure like-minded are on the same page. So it is, it is a, a huge advantage to have conversations there. Um, uh, so working back from that, um, I guess jumping over to um, the inspections context and, 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 and then um, continuing from there. Um, the information about angles um, being a base that could be utilized has not been tied to coming from inspections, of course. And the idea um, that um, inspections provide um, more information than is available just from watching the news as to where um, attacks are launched from or to understanding uh, what Russia is doing um, in, in targeting Ukraine, I think is, is really not, is not that credible, right? The, we understand that Putin has expressed concerns about um, more information sharing through the inspections than otherwise would be the case without the inspections, but the information that's shared really goes to verification of the treaty and verification of compliance with the treaty, um, which is what we've been trying to say all along, is that if you have concerns about our compliance, come inspect us under the treaty. Um, and so it seems like a good excuse for him to provide uh, that inspections uh, will potentially give more information that could help um, you know, the Ukrainians, uh, but, but it's just not credible because it really is related to verifying New START. Um, and, and as we discussed, it would help them to, to verify their, confirm, their concerns about our uh, conversion activities. So it's in both countries' interest to continue this um, and, and not credible to suggest otherwise. Um, with respect to INF and the continuing moratorium, I think we do need to have this comprehensive conversation. It was started at least um, uh, to a certain degree through the SSD, the strategic stability dialogues that we had with Russia um, right up until they invaded Ukraine again. Um, and, and those are important conversations to continue. Um, but it's very hard to talk about what the possibilities are now um, when we can't convince Russia to comply with New START itself. And, and it, it's a challenge uh, to start talking about new mechanisms um, with them in, in light of that most recent development. Um, all right, you have to remind me now because I haven't had enough coffee Nucle today. Nuclear saber rattling. Yes, nuclear saber rattling. Of course, it's very difficult. We've been watching closely their, their nuclear posture. Um, it has not changed, nor have we seen the reason to change ours. But it's something that um, does span uh, you know, the, the range of politically motivated in, in many parts, but also potentially um, you know, continuing the destabilization efforts of the international community, trying to 
um, sort of argue uh, to those um, partner nations that are working um, to support Ukraine that they shouldn't support Ukraine, right? This nuclear saber rattling achieves many objectives from Russia, and all of them are, are destabilizing and unhelpful. And so while we're, we're watching their nuclear posture closely, um, and it hasn't changed as far as uh, the most recent communication I've heard from um, uh, the Department of Defense colleagues, um, it's, it's, it's destabilizing to, to, to continue this type of behavior. And I think most countries see it as, so, as such. Um, but of course, it's in their interest, in the Russians' interest, to try to prevent the unity of like-minded nations in pushing back on their aggression. And so it serves several interests, and it's extraordinarily unhelpful. I'm trying to push against it. Well, uh, Mallory, thanks uh, so much for joining us. It, it, it's difficult to uh, expose yourself, especially on the record, uh, so, so soon after a development like uh, Putin's uh, announcement, uh, when the situation has not entirely uh, clarified. But you've done a terrific job. Uh, you've covered a lot of ground, and you've helped us understand uh, where we are in the wake of the announcement, but also uh, administration uh, thinking uh, on uh, arms control and uh, risk reduction going forward. So we're in debt to you. Uh, we also appreciate very much uh, those who uh, joined us here at Brookings, and as well as the very large uh, audience that viewed this session uh, online. So please help. Uh, uh, let's, uh, let's join in thanking uh, Assistant Secretary Mallory Stewart uh, for being here today.